Well, this evening's topic is about exploring technology to support learning in the new norm. We are very happy to have with us two speakers, Vincent Kwa and Dr. Tio Chiu Li. They will be introduced by our moderator, Dr. Jennifer Yeo. Dr. Yeo is an assistant professor at the Natural Sciences and Science Education, Academic Group and Office of Education Research, National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University. I shall now pass the session on to Dr. Yeo. Over to you, Doctor. Thank you, Ashi, for the introduction, and good evening, everybody. I'm very happy to introduce our two speakers for this evening, Vincent and Chu Li. They will share with us some tips on how technology can be better utilized to support our children's learning. Without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, Mr. Vincent Kwa. Vincent is a regional head for Asia Pacific and Japan with Amazon Web Services where he oversees the education, research, healthcare, and not-for-profit sectors. The title of Vincent's presentation is really interesting, Drink Tea and Keep Calm, Navigation Tips for this period. Over to you, Vincent. Thank you, Jennifer. Let me now quickly share my screen and we can begin this discussion. A very good evening, everybody, from wherever you are. Uh, it's a pleasure for me uh, to be part of this Education in the City series that is hosted by the National Library Board. As uh, Jennifer has mentioned, my, the title of my talk is Drink Tea and Keep Calm, Navigational Tips for the Spirit. And this is an important topic where, you know, if you're trying to take a photo like this of what I'm showing you on the slide right now, the water that does the reflection of the beautiful snow-capped mountain has to be extremely still. And then you can only get a really almost perfect reflection photo of the beautiful snow-capped mountains. And you got to be patient and ready before you actually take the photo. There are two parts to my sharing. The first, is actually surprisingly a non-technology part. But the second, and I'll be talking about just a couple of pieces of technology where it can actually prove to be useful. Useful to help us understand a very important topic which I'll later talk about, which is essentially is about our children's well-being. So without further ado, let me quickly dive into the first part which is really not about the technology, and it's really about each one of us. In the first section about us, there are two points that I want to bring up. First, it's really about setting yourself up for success. This is a very important first step in whatever that you are trying to do especially in this chaotic moment. What you see in this picture is actually a near perfect preserved version of the largest Viking ship that was um, you know, pulled out of the muddy waters of the river of Stockholm. It is an incredible museum piece and you can see the extent of the size of this Viking ship and you can see the some people on the bottom left. How they actually, you know, bring this uh, sunken Viking ship from the muddy waters and then into this museum, it's a really amazing story. And I do encourage you, if you have time, go do a search to, about this Viking ship in Stockholm. And it's really about understanding what you need to put in place to set yourself up for success. This is an important step because even before you touch the technology piece, the conditions that allow you to become successful in managing this environment, this chaotic environment, you got to understand how you can go about doing it. And some of the tips that I'm going to share with you today, is not something that I conjure up, but it's quite available 
across the internet. And this is one link that you have. And so let me dive quickly what it means then to be set up, setting yourself up for success. There are three parts to this aspect of setting yourself up for success. The first is around, about making space. And what I meant about making space is really understanding that whatever activities that we are doing, we got to create the right space for the different set of activities. For example, you got to create a space somewhere in your house, in one location, a space for learning for your child. For yourself, maybe a space for work. For your family, a space for relationship building, for conversation, and for family related things. And perhaps even a space for leisure. The tricky thing is about understanding when you move from one space to another space, what's the different expectation, which is the second point that I'm talking about. Because when you're in a particular space, we got to set the right expectation for the right behavior and create that condition that will encourage the right behavior. It is not just about our children, but it's also about ourselves that we should not be uh, blurring the lines of those different spaces. And it helps. The third point about setting yourself up for success is that actually routine helps. You know, one of the benefit for me personally during this COVID-19 situation is that I've developed a very good routine from the time I wake up to the end of the day. And some of the routines that I've built in, for myself at least, is that the first thing in the morning, I will always hydrate myself with a big cup of water so as to refresh myself, hydrate, and then you know, go into a different mode. And then I'll spend the next few moments usually reading and thinking about some key questions uh, or some major topics and agenda that I have to deal with for the rest of the day. And then another benefit that I, I, I actually uh, put in was that I built in also an exercise routine. And so when you create routine, you actually also invariably create space for some very specific activities. And so all these three uh, elements actually work together to um, relate and make things even better and easier for you to manage the condition around your house, especially when you're moving from one thing to another thing and you're at your work and your child is studying, it's going to be quite difficult. And so by creating space, setting expectation and re recalibrate on some of these expectations, set routines, what time to do certain things, all these will actually go a very long way to help the child. The second point that I want to talk about is that you got to stay focused. Um, this is a picture of the Antelope Canyon in the US and I was there and I somehow managed to be at the right place at the right time where there's this ray of light shining down at the canyon. And I was able to get a picture of it. It's really about being focused, knowing what is it that you are trying to achieve. And there are a number of things that I want to talk about. The focus that I'm talking about it's really, in a sense, it's really about encouraging each one person, your child, and maybe yourself, to take ownership and to put in the right effort. Uh, what you see in this picture is the Horseshoe Bend, Horseshoe Canyon, also in the US. I took this picture, and the only way that I can take this picture is that I had to climb a certain hill 
overcoming obstacle in order to get to the top so that I can have that vantage point of being able to take a picture of how this horseshoe canyon actually looked like. It's pretty an incredible sight. But if I don't take ownership of overcoming some of the obstacles that's ahead of me, right? If you don't set space, you don't create the space, if you don't create a routine, if you don't set the right expectation and encourage the child to do that, you're not going to be able to help him or her being focused. And of course, putting the right effort is going to be important as well. You know, in these two points of setting up for success, as well as being staying focused, at the end, it is really about a journey. It is a process in which you get to learn about what you do, how to do things. It's a process where you are engaged with your child, not just involved, but you are actually engaged. And the one thing I would want to encourage everybody to take home, it is about encouraging self-regulation. Your child to be responsible for themselves. Now, I know it's easier said than done, but if we don't start, we will never get to get to that point of having and growing, helping our child um, growing up with the ability to self-regulate. And this is something that we have to do. And because it is a journey, we will invariably always be unlearning and learning and relearning. And the process goes on. And now this bubble uh, is a picture that I took in the city of Chicago. And it's a beautiful uh, sculpture because actually through this bubble, you can actually see the reflection of, you know, almost all the buildings and landscape in this particular area. And this is, again, another amazing sight that uh, you can see and observe for yourself. Now, in order to be able to create this bubble, you, you can't go with the standard architecture. You've got to break some rules here. And then before you can break any rules, you've got to unlearn some of the bad things and then learn how to overcome, to solve this problem, solve this vision, this bubble that you're trying to build. Right? And along the way, you will make mistakes, so you've got to relearn. And so this process of unlearning, learning, and relearning, and then all over again, will help us build resilience, will help us set up for success, and will help us stay focused. So much for about our, ourselves. So the next topic that I really want to talk about is about the individual well-being of our children. I have three university-going children. Uh, when, and although I may not be in a very similar situation as maybe in, with some of you where you have younger children, nonetheless, you know, they, they, they are our children and we care for them, we love them, and we want them to be well. And this idea, this notion of well-being is such an important concept that even last week's, last Sunday's paper, there were two very specific articles that talk about what is it that we can do to support our children. But the first is about praising our children through this pandemic. And we know that we are in the PSLE season. There are things that we should encourage them and, 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 and do that. But the second article, which is actually a lot more optimistic, is that it tells the story of how our young people are actually very resilient and they are overcomers. But leaving them on their own accord may not be the best strategy. And so getting engaged, helping them along the way, it's a very important part of the process. Now in the slide where I have individual well-being, you see a beautiful picture of actually a sunrise, right? Orange colors and all that. But what you didn't know is that an hour later, it was thundering storm. And it's the same thing with an understanding about the well-being of our children. 
We see them on, our sur on the surface, but we actually don't know what's going on inside. Underneath them, within their hearts, within their minds, you don't know what they're going through. And so I want to talk about two specific technology tools that you can explore and try to understand, uh, help you understand your child a little bit more, or actually provide some boundaries for your child to operate within. The first is this tool called safe to net We are all on our devices 24-7, you know, more time than we ever concede to be. I think even we ourselves are guilty of that, spending a lot more time watching Netflix uh, and other kinds of videos um, on TV. But what are our children doing when they are in their own space, in their own room, on their own device? This technology is able to track the things that they type, the sites that they interact with, you know, are they tending towards self-harm? Are they encountering uh, bullying on the web? Are they experiencing stress to the point where they want to do something bad to their own bodies? Right, so this is something, a piece of technology that is actually very helpful for many, many people. The next tool is predicated on a piece of research uh, that started by this organization called the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Young People. What you see there on the slide are, are their priority directions. And the main tenet driver of all that they do is really about preparing young children for the future and for a successful future, right? About improving learning and development, improving educational performance, including he improving health, emotional well being, promoting participation, and reducing disadvantage arising from income disparity. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play a short video to show you how this particular tool works in the context of a school. And what I'll do is I'll stop share and reshare so that you can all watch the video. So the tool is called Pulse, and what it does is that all it takes is 60 seconds for students to respond to a set of questions, and all these questions were based on the research done by the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Young People. And it's able to track, um, you know, to a certain degree, you know, how well the child is doing. Are they facing stress? Are they encountering problems? and even gives them an opportunity to request for help. And then that's where the pastoral staff in the school can come in and help them. So, um, so the tool is really simple to use. All you need is just less than 60 seconds to 120 seconds, answer a few questions based on the research from the ARACY. Um, something that is not that I promote it, but it's something that I find very, very useful. And so, you know, safe to net, Pulse, these are just sample tools that can be used effectively to understand the well-being of the individual. And so with that, you know, I really appreciate each one of you spending time and paying attention to this. And I hope um, you, 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 you've learned something, you've picked up some tips on what is possible for you to actually do with your child, with your child 
and about also about for yourself. And with that, thank you very much. Back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Vincent, for the presentation. I'm sure parents here have picked up many tools, many tips, many tools on how they can manage their children's well-being and um, as well as how they could go about setting up for success. And after feeling calm, we will now have our second speaker who will share with us how we can go about exciting the children to build their ideas. So our second speaker for this evening is Dr. Tio Chiu Li. Dr. Tio is the Senior Research Scientist in the Office of Education Research in NIE. She is also the Program Director for the Learning Sciences and Innovation Research Program that seeks to leverage on technology to prepare learners to be future ready. Her research focuses on understanding children's mind and experiences in a technology-enhanced environment. The title of her presentation is Teach Your Child to Use Technology for Creative Knowledge Building. Over to you, Chuli. Thank you, Jennifer. I am going to start by asking either um, Pei Ling or Gina, could you share the slides for me instead? So while Vivian is pulling out the slides, um, thank you so much everybody for attending this session and thank you Vincent for that very um, informative talk. And for today, um, like what Jennifer said, I think I want to excite you with some of the things that we are seeing from our research about students' questions and idea in an environment that is filled with technology, gadget, internet connection and, and whatnot. So um, I'm going to share some of the research work with school teachers from preschool all the way to secondary, as well as some of the work from the Learning Sciences and Innovation Group in, in NIE. And hopefully through the sharing of this research work, you can use it and you can glean some um, useful tips in your own engagement with your children. I saw the slides up, is it? Yeah, thank you. So for today, I think the talk is actually um, on three pointer. Um, first one, it is actually from, if we use technology, if uh, Vivian can click on, from content knowledge, um, how do we move on from just learning a content knowledge, let's say solving a maths uh, problem, to actually helping our children to use the technology world to understand the world. So uh, if Vivian can keep clicking, it's okay. And we know that we always want our children to be clever, to be smarter, to have all the critical thinking. But more than this higher order thinking, there's something precious about learning, about learning. They learn about learning. So if Vivian can just uh, click clicking. Yeah, so that's the second one. I, I want to see whether our, my research work and some of the things that we do here in NIE can, can help us think about technology use with our children children in a different way. And the third one, of course, many of us lament that you know, technology took away our children from social interaction, but actually technology has a power of creating that shared experience. So some of the work today may give you some ideas on how to do that with your children. I just want to start off by quoting a group of researchers in 2008. Um, I think their research is still very much um, standing today. If uh, The next slide. Um, this group of researchers actually trace about 50 students in their home interviewing parents, family and so on. And interestingly, they found that the children's experience with technology differed considerably from one family to another. They realized that even if all the family has their TV switched on, the children actually appear to vary in enthusiasm with certain things that they were doing. So what makes that difference? I think today, hopefully through the talk and discussion, we can look at it a little bit more. And just starting off this, the next slide, I, I want us to kind of think through when we label our children as digital native. Um, I want to think like when we call them that naturally they are more um, used to the tool because they are living in a technology savvy world. They, they wake up to handphones and so on. But it's almost the same way as a farmer's children will learn to farm more quickly. We have to Think about really, are children really wired differently? Do they really pick up the tool and fly with it? Um, I want to ask the parents among us, if you are working with young children, do you find your, yourself having to show them that the button or the scroll down at some 
point of time, I think these are important that they are learning as well. And we can engage them in the learning around technology by showing interest, by asking questions, and by making suggestions. Because knowing that children, they don't just pick up the skill. They learn by watching, they learn by copying, and, and you and I as parents at home, we are the ones that are watching that and they are copying. So just this backdrop about digital native, and there's this huge elephant in, in the room when we talk about technology and children, and that's the next slide. We talk about electronic babysitting. I think we see that a lot in food court, in shopping mall, in restaurant, and understandably, we need some time off from our children. Sometimes we want to keep them occupied but i would suggest maybe not all the time so today hopefully the discussion can show you some tips that even if you leave them to watch a video after that how can you engage them there is a very unique reason why when children sit together in school and watch the same youtube videos you might be showing at home and they, they get excited they get intrigued it's the interaction that surrounds it so today I really need to explore that technology for shared experience. Um, starting to talk about my research work on knowledge building, um, is, is about students' idea, students' question, and we think that they are valuable. But an idea is a dime a dozen. Other than them having the idea, we want them to actually improve and work hard and improve their idea. So I'll just give two key ideas about this knowledge building classroom, just to start me introducing the, the work that we do and some of the concepts that we talked about just now. The first is children working together and working creatively with ideas and they produce artifact. And the second thing is we want them to develop empathy, open-mindedness and more importantly, a healthy communication habit because we, apart from academic, we want them to develop socially and emotionally as well. And, and this, we hear it from Vincent's talk. So just want to zoom in a little bit on ways to creating that shared experience. Um, just the next one. Yeah. So if you can look at this, this is from five years old, a uh, classroom of teachers starting a topic of food. So instead of starting to teach about food, this was done actually before anything was being thought. So the teachers are set with this five years old and say that, okay, um, what do you know? What comes into your mind when you talk about food? And this brainstorming is actually very important because one of my good friends in the next slide, he, talk, he heard me talk about this knowledge building wall and idea wall. And he says that, let me go back and try it with my boy. So he has two, four and eight years old boy. And he started to get them to write their question that they had in car rides, in dinner time, um, and he started to put it up all over the, the home. Of course, it's his little experiment with his children, but I think from last I heard of him, he said that the children are getting a little bit serious about um, learning, and they're asking him, uh, could you like Google certain things with, with a certain question in mind? So, you, you know, parents among us, you might want to try this. And let's get back to the knowledge building classroom on food. So apart from brainstorming about food, the teacher then brought the students out. The next slide, even thanks. The, the teachers brought the students out to hawker center and to wet market, right? But the, is the, the experience, we bring our children out day in, day out, but now the children know that they have to observe because they, they need to get back to the classroom to share what they see. So just now you see that the teacher was driving in very neat handwriting. And now you see that the children got a chance to actually share their ideas. They wrote it down and they also share it in group. Um, so they were talking about you know, wet market being wet. They saw food wastage. And the next slide comes to a point where the teacher created all this knowledge building talk and later on we'll talk about the knowledge building at home um, moment at home so you can see that these little children their ideas about idea is quite abstract so what we did was to give them lego block or duplo block that represent idea so if there's someone put up an idea and someone says that 
uh, is listening attentively and say something that is related to their friend's idea, they get to put their blocks close together. If they are not listening and suddenly their mind go haywire and they went to something else, then their blocks has to be far apart. So what these young children know is that I want to build a, a castle. I want my idea. So they are listening and they are trying to connect their ideas with each other. So they came out with these two questions. What happened to the wasted and balanced food that they observe in Hawker Centre? And they talk about whether there is a zero food wastage. Um, and the children start to think about their own food wastage um, during meal time because these children eat at home. And they told the teachers that they want to talk to Uncle John because Uncle John is the person that brings them food. So, so this engagement with another person. Now, while all these are going on in the next slide, we see that the teachers were actively sharing YouTube video um, resources about food wastage, about recycling. But these are resources shared to the children to find out more about the problem of food wastage, right? So how they are engaging with this material and resources are very important. Now, the next slide that we show actually show you that the children then realize that, oh, not only just our class, we want to see what other classes are doing. So they were given camera during lunchtime and to go around to take pictures of the leftover food in their basket. And they, they started charting it and they put the chart all over the corridor and they start to re they started to revisit this, this chart so that they know what is happening. And they were very honest. They realized that the class was a problem then. Um, but the teacher also made them run around to the other teachers to ask for permission. Now, as, as we move on, the children are thinking, uh, are really thinking hard about zero food wastage. And they started to ask about if this is in Singapore and, and if this is in our classroom and this is in our school, what happened to the world? So instead, so the next slide has a teacher instead of, so they were interested in what happened in the world. So instead of showing them about food wastage, the teacher introduced the different ideas and showed them the, the children who were suff the places that there were food shortage. And, and these children, because they saw that, oh, there's this another whole new world about food wastage, they started to bring in books. Now, the idea about building our environment with these resources because information comes so easily. How do you get your children to be interested and to make sense and to look at internet as one of the sources of information is, is through your interaction and how do you build up their interest about the problem. And of course, in, in between, they, they talked to the vice principal, um, they went to the food pantry, but just to cut the story short in the next slide, the children realized that they had to make a um, they make a, a, a note. They have to make a message out to the school. So what they decided to do was to make poster. More importantly, throughout this engagement, you see in and out technology engagement with each other, with their teachers, with expert, or with even the the, the Uncle John who is who brought them food every day. They realized that the class realized that before we eat our food, we better redistribute it. Once you redistribute it, we actually cut short the food wastage. And true enough, um, I think a couple of the students who were not used to finishing up the food gave away the food before they ate them and kind of everybody finished the food. So these are the things as we move on to the next slide. We are reminded of the three points that I try to bring across today. How do we bring the children from content knowledge to understanding the world, from higher order thinking to learning about learning? and to have that shared experience through technology. And so let's listen to the teacher's reflection in the next slide. He, she said that through brainstorming, through knowledge building talks, through field trip, the children actually understanding the real idea and authentic problem of food wastage of the world. And by scribing their ideas, by showing them this is their question, this is what they have done, by doing a second field trip, 
students are working hard to find information to improve their understanding of food wastage. And by getting different people of the community, by watching video, visiting food pantry, they're learning these different things and they start to realize their own habits of eating and so on. So this is really how um, technology in, in the next slide um, we have created that shared experience. Just a quick personal sharing. I was in this Northern Thailand trip we were teaching the kids craft and language. So the, the kids, obviously, we had to use our handphone to take pictures and look for resources and the children were distracted. So during break time, I had this idea. I said, why don't I give this to an eight year old boy and say, go around, take pictures. But come back and tell me a story with the picture. So in the next slide, uh, he came back 20 minutes, minutes later and he took all these slides and he told me with in Thai and in language, in, in body language and, and in broken lang uh, English, of course, mine is in broken Thai, um, but he used more English than he has learned in the whole morning. Right? So these are the picture he says that, oh, these are the girls from his tribe and he wanted to show the uh, the costume. This is the boy from Singapore that, that I kept, he saw me asking him to put away the phone. So he wanted to do the same thing. So he asked the boy from Singapore to put down the phone and post for a picture. So he could tell, I put a picture of him taking me because I wanted to tell you that this is real. So if Vivian can click, the, the text will come out. Now with the right support, um, use your handphone, take pictures, actually is a way to have the children communicate over time. And it's actually very important for them to develop the communication skill. And we do this all the time. Our children are taking photo. And I remember there's this lady, Elizabeth Strout, a very famous author. She said that when she was young, her mother gave her a journal and she didn't know any other way to express except through the journal. And that kept her habit. And, and she wrote a very famous book, um, Olive Kittredge, if some of you heard about it. So I think this is important for us to look at our children interaction. And the next slide is interesting because the next slide, for those among us who are thinking like, okay, this kind of engagement, what is, what is it so useful? Now, we have another group of researchers, um, they do image, they are their short term, they uh, short form for their project, um, they do math game. Um, an intervention of neuroscience in education. So what they do is they realize that it's actually important for children to use symbolic numbers. Um, many of us experience with young children, you give them a five, they can recognize it. But if you ask them to count five coins, five apple, they may have difficulty. So engaging them in all the symbolic numbers throughout their daily life is important. Now, the second thing they found from neuroscience education is the max anxiety actually affect the max performance. We want to get our child to enjoy learning, but not so much as, you know, they can do whatever they like, but they have to work hard, but work on things that they are interested. So just a little bit to convince you that it's actually quite important to engage in, um, in your child in a knowledge building way. Um, for the next slide, we'll show you some of the KB scaffold. I think it's the next one. Yeah, so we created all these cards. So if, if we, we send it home to our parents as well, and if they're home reading and online storybooks and so on with the children, um, they can actually use this card. This, this card kind of serves to slow us down so that we are not the, the one giving the answer, but we are the one engaging our children around all this information in, in a more engaging uh, way. Now, the, the next part I'm gonna deal with in a very short, to, um, two, three minutes is our interaction. Now there's this very, very famous work in the next slide that I show by Carol uh, Duet. And she talks about um, mindset, growth mindset. And Vincent talked about success as well. And she says that if you want to praise your child, even praising, you got to praise them such that they will work harder. They, they don't get praised because they've done something well and they will be so afraid of failure. Right? How do we praise such that they are looking at what actually might work better for them instead of if I do this, I get a praise. If I don't do well, I don't get a praise. So this is a very important message for all of us. We, we kind of 
be very generous about our praise, but what it, where, is that, where are all these praises getting us towards? So I, I just want to show you the last two slides at what, how the children can amaze you. So these are three years old work. They are looking at stick and stone, and I have the text that Vivian can show. So it's, it's really interesting, these children, they are working with stick and stone. They are trying to figure out the structure that works for stick and stone, and the teacher was just kind of letting them go. And what happened is that the children say, this is from the teacher's um, transcription, right? The students, they can really tell me what their things look like. So along the way, they realize that there's a problem. Their houses cannot stand. Then one person managed to make the house stand. And they're like, wow, how did that happen? And it's three years old. And how come this house can stand? And they realize that this person has made the stone at the bottom. And everybody was kind of wondering, and they kind of come up with different ways, but they kind of took that idea. And so how the three years old, without the teacher, really saying, wow, this is so good. And the teachers was like, come, let's, let's look at what is happening. And they could actually learn from each other. Um, the next slide actually show you also a very interesting five years old. They were wondering about this question about why water droplet form on the outside. And the teacher kind of, so what do we do? Um, did the water leak out? Um, if Vivian can keep clicking, um, how can we find out? And the amazing thing is the children come up with the most ingenious idea. Dye the water blue. If we found that the water on the outside is blue, then it must have leaked out. If it's not blue, it's not licked up. So of course they went into the concept of condensation and all this. I just want to reiterate that knowledge building works for children as young as three. And we have found that it works for children who are labeled academically weak and who are labeled weak in language. It's the power of giving a chance for our children to work with ideas is just mind blowing. I mean, every year I go into a classroom and every year I see things that I've never thought before. So I just want to bring the message back to the three things that we talk about today in terms of the next slide, how we can move. I think we can move to the next one. Okay, sorry. I'll just touch a little bit on this. Um, learning actually, I want to bring out also, it goes beyond the PSLE exam. And even in the PSLE exam, if you look at the syllabus, there are these big ideas. So actually in the curriculum, it is important for our children to be connecting, to be working towards the big idea as well, so that they have a deeper understanding of things. And in the next slide, we'll just revisit, okay, when we deal with technology, how do we look at it differently? Rather than learning about a math problem, let them understand the world. Rather than thinking about critically making them smarter, cleverer, let them have an experience to reflect on how they're learning. Rather than replacing social interaction, create the shared experience with the children. And I just want to end this um, talk by bringing back Carol Duet's uh, um, quote to say that the best thing you can do is to teach your child to love challenges, to be intrigued by mistakes, to enjoy effort, and to keep on learning. That way your child doesn't have to be slave to anything, to praises, to anything. They will be a lifelong learner and they will get back their confidence even if they fail. So I hope, um, I look forward to the discussion and then we can have more to talk about. Uh, I'll hand it back to Jennifer. Right, thank you Julie for the very interesting um, sharing of all the many anecdotes that you have come across with teachers and parents working with children's ideas. Yeah, we will now have the Q&A session and we have about 10 minutes. We will try to answer um, as many questions as we can. Um, okay, that is a very first question asked, um, Mark asked whether the presentations will be shared with the participants. Uh, the video will be uploaded um, after um, the session. And I think later Ashif can give you more information as to how you can access that. Um, there's another question um, and that's from Chitra, and um, your question is, thank you, Dr. Teo. I like some of the strategies that teachers can use in the classroom. To what extent are teachers trained to apply them in the classroom? Yeah. 
Thanks for asking that question, Chitra. Um, it is really interesting. In, in my research work over the last 10 years, we, we, we try to put teachers on a knowledge building mood. So they are playing with their own lesson ideas, lesson design, and we work very much, um, gather teachers in, in, in our session every week. This is kind of a regular structure in school, but what do they discuss? So we got teachers to bring in their students' ideas and to talk about what can they do next. Because I think many things are happening in knowledge building classes and if the owner is on the teachers to kind of understand the ideas and pick up on those more promising one or interesting one and help the students to shape their problem and move forward. So I must say there are many ways to developing teachers' prof uh, professional for this, we have chosen the way to put the teachers as community to work in a knowledge building way as they develop their competency um, in, in knowledge building uh, practice, creating all this uh, interesting knowledge building classroom. So I hope I've answered that question. Yeah, I think you have answered the question. Um, there's a reply from, from the, the person who asked the question. Yep. Um, Okay, questions are slow in coming in, but maybe I could ask some questions to the two speakers. Um, you have all talked about, you know, how to set up uh, for success and also how to be successful in working with students' ideas. You know, so I'm just wondering, based on your experience, whether what might then be some of the uh, pitfalls that parents or even teachers should avoid in terms of... Um, yeah, in terms of helping our children, our, uh, our students um, in, in trying to succeed in whatever they do. Is it? <laughs> Maybe I'll yeah. just venture off and kind of go first, right? So um, I think as parents, um, the pitfalls that I personally face is either we try too hard or we try too little and trying to find what is that optimal uh, effort and, and engagement, it's, it's really difficult because it really changes from situation to situation. It also changes when your child growing, grows, grows up, right? At the younger age, perhaps they need a lot more um, supervision and they need a lot more guidance. But as they grow older, I think we as parents, and because we learn it ourselves as well, we need to learn to let go and allow our, our, our children to explore. Uh, and like um, the quote that, um, you know, Julie talked about, you know, how to, how to face up to challenges, not be afraid of, of failures, build resilience in our children so that they can learn to be confident uh, about what they are doing and how they are going about doing it because we can't be there for our children all the time and so I'm just going to leave it as there so it's always so it comes back to the point that I made which is about unlearning learning and then relearning all over again and keep that cycle going so we got to be models of that we uh, we have a question coming in I, I don't know whether we should look at that and then I'll just kind of add in my share sure um, right, there's just a question that has just come in from Siti Mariam and she says, hello, um, one of the anecdotes that was shared about the Zero Waste program sounds very much like Seoul, self-organized learning environment. Do you think it might be, that may, it, might, it may be something in common that teachers could do in all schools and topics? I think, um, yeah, this question is for Julie. Yes, I, um, I must say I'm not too familiar with self-organizing learning environment, but I think the way that they allow students autonomy in, in creating the thing, um, in, in working on problems um, may be very, very similar. So yes, I would say that it's something common that teachers should do if you are focusing on how students are learning, what are the questions and what are the ideas they have. And, but the willingness to go along with the student's idea may, may vary across different practices. Uh, 
some may have a more um, structured way, they, but they open up. Uh, but I still believe that in opening up the space for students to make sense of what is given to them. Um, but for knowledge building classroom, we kind of push it to the other extreme that our teachers are, are really willing to, to uh, change and redesign their practice according to the uh, students' idea and question. Yeah, so I think there's great potential in, in uh, looking at some of these common practices and see where is the place of students' idea and question um, in the whole practice. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Chuli. Uh, one more question that has just come in. I believe that's also for you. How much content do you think schools need to cut down to allow such projects to be carried out in and out of a classroom? Yeah. That, that is a really uh, good question. Um, the content actually um, has been um, reviewed very specifically. Jennifer and I are nodding because we both sit in curriculum review committee. Um, the, the key idea about the cutting down is actually for teachers to engage them with the big idea that I very quickly show it. But I think if you Google for the curriculum document, you can actually see that these are the key big idea. For example, if students are learning digestion, um, are they look, looking at it as a system in the whole body? If you are looking at water cycle, are they understanding the interaction with the environment? So I, I think that um, not so much in cutting down, but reviewing so that the connection between curriculum and how, how the key inquiry question can be fronted so that students have more space to, to move around. I think that has been done over the years. So in the practice itself, for teachers to be able to make sense of this big idea, I think it's more of understanding the big idea and seeing how the different curriculum get connected. Um, yeah. So I, I would say that. Right. Thank you, Julie. All right, I have a question here for Vincent. And um, this question goes like that. There's a lot of talk about AI nowadays. Will AI help children and schools? Or will schools become redundant one day? So um, I'm actually also very passionate about education. In fact, I, when I started my career, I, I actually was a teacher. So uh, I'm a firm believer that, you know, when education is done right, um, there's always a role for teachers. There is always a role for schools. Now that form and factor may however change. Um, I think the notion of AI um, in education, uh, you can take the discussion to an extreme end, but it is easy to imagine, but it's very hard to see how AI can actually replace, um, you know, a person. Because uh, in order to construct a good AI, and, and AI typically are very, very specific in solving problems, right? If you have a problem that is like, you're suffering a thousand paper cuts and you can use AI to address and alleviate that problem. That's what they are very, very good at. But if, if you're trying to solve a problem, if, if this is this and not that, and what about this condition and that condition, you know, trying to build something that is intelligent artificially, it's actually a very, very difficult problem to solve. And so it is not necessarily something that is foreseeable in the future. Eventually, yes, it might happen, but right now, um, you know, I don't think we need to be worried about that part of it. It can be applied in the right way, and I think we are all trying to understand how we use it in an appropriate manner. Right. Thank you, Vincent. That sounds pretty reassuring for people like myself. And truly, you want to add in some more? Well, I just want to add on, like from our research, actually, we are also going into machine learning and AI. But we use it to actually help us understand the huge or corpus of data that's coming into us, like students' facial expression, their movement. How do we know that they are actively engaged? And because the data is growing, uh, so we are looking at AI capacity to actually make sense of this data to help teachers very quickly know that this children, this child may not be that not engaged. He's just, you know, um, thinking about something else. So if we have the capability to manage a huge corpus of data from the students, then we do not always rely on what we can see from the student because sometimes no matter how experienced we are as a teacher, we, we read our child children uh, a little bit 
off. Yeah, so I just want to add from the research angle some of the new AI thing that we are engage, uh, we are embarking on. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Julie. Uh, we have one more question here, and it comes from Sharon Ong, and the question goes this way: Hi. I'm neither a teacher nor a parent. I'm a professional nanny. I'm also an experienced Kids Read volunteer with children aged two to six. I find it very useful to make judicious use of online resources such as YouTube. I've noticed that young parents are very anxious about screens. Two parents even gave me the impression that they were concerned that the screens might be used as electronic babysitters. However, a lot of care goes into curation and selection on her part. What is the experts feel on the dangers of screens? So um, either Vincent or Julie could go first. Yeah. Julie. <laughs> okay. Um, I actually don't have the ballpark figure about screen time, but I think right now the schools are saying um, not more than continuous, I think it's about half an hour or so on the screen, which I, I, I do agree that the, the screen time in giving children a little bit of rest, when we do long research, like I have a research that got students to, to work on cognitive tasks on screen, we also make sure that they get a break in between. So I do agree that we have to be a little bit careful and in terms of screen time but as long as I think um, the, the point about e-babysitting is you leave it, your child there and then you are not engaging them actively um, but do a, a little bit um, more aware of the break time a little bit of rest time in between for them to get away from the screen um, as they continue because if they are engaged um, thinking about questions like just now what I show you, um, they, they actually can pick up the things that they need to look at rather than they are viewing. A lot of these screen time issues goes into really like the um, electronic babysitting where you see that the child are completely on their own and they watch repeatedly because children get excited with the cartoon that they like so they watch over and over again. So I, 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 I know it's not a very technical answer but I don't know Vincent you can, you can add on. Oh, so it's plus one on that. It's really about when you're using a particular technology or device, um, it's really the engagement, you know. What's that level of engagement that you have with the child? Uh, and if, if you just leave the device and the child by its own, then obviously, you know, you are part of the, you're part of the problem as well. Um, so, so I think the bigger issue is really more the duration um, and, and the control of that duration. Uh, in today's context, I'm working from home 24-7, right? I'm facing a screen all the time. I actually find that I need to walk away from my computer, go somewhere else, go and look at the green trees, take a short break, do something different, and then come back and then get work started again. And so, so having breaks and, and respecting that space. So it's going back to that space and creating the right space for the right thing. I think that is something that is important. Right. Um, thank you for your responses to the question. Okay, I think uh, we, uh, we have already exceeded the time and um, we will uh, close the Q&A session. And sorry, Julie? So, Sharon is um, continuing that conversation. So just oh, a sorry. One. I do agree um, because what she says is she curated and, and she, so as definitely if it's not, the kind of very long extension, but even with um, active engagement, you can um, you can give the children a little bit of break. So I agree that, um, so she's responding on the chat. And I do agree with her that as long as that active engagement, you do need a certain amount of screen time. Um, the thing I can add on is just a little bit break in between for the child to kind of rest the eye. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for the question. Thanks. Okay, looks like we have one more question that has just come in to the um, Q&A uh, chat line and this comes from Davina. So uh, maybe we should answer this question. And Davina asks, may I ask what are some other online resources to create those knowledge building moments in school and at home other than storybooks? Uh. 
I um, think. Yeah, so there, um, I think the online storybook is one thing that we use quite extensively for young children. Uh, the other thing that we've shown is YouTube video. Some of the things that we have actually shown, like the children are doing Planet, right? So we go into NASA resource the real community and we show them like astronaut on, on the moon throwing down the feather and the metal uh, ball. So we do go into the actual scientific community or even the biology, like some of this natural world um, or even the recent COVID-19, we actually show real data that is collated on some of these WHO um, to help our children engage. So it's not just those online. Sometimes you can show them real data. They get really excited because now I think the visualization is quite nice. They, they use a lot of graph that the children can actually look at and it actually develops some of their graphical literacy as well. Yeah. Right, great, wonderful. Um, yeah, there's one more last, last question that uh, uh, which I think we can squeeze in. And um, it asks, uh, the person asks, if I can buy only one technology, what could that, what could that be? What should that be? Yes. I think this one, Vincent, you got to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a very simple answer. It will have to be a technology that you will be prepared to use as often as you can and as more re as relevant as it is for your context. The example that I want to share with you is very simple. Um, you know, I wanted to, you know, I'm a, I'm a uh, photography enthusiast. So I love to buy SLRs, right? The single lens reflex type of camera, big bulky camera with all the lenses. And then on one particular holiday, my wife asked me, so are you going to carry the two and a half kilo of equipment everywhere we go? and take pictures and all that stuff with the tripod and an extra bag and all the other additional bags that you're going to carry? Or are you going to carry your smartphone, your smart device? It's just going to take picture uh, that you're not going to print. <laughs> you're going to only watch uh, only on screen. And that was a moment, like an aha moment. It says, actually, I spend 99% of my time taking pictures on my mobile phone. And when, is, where, when was the last time I used my actual camera camera? Oh, wow, that was a few years ago. <laughs> so my advice is buy a technology or invest in a technology that you know that you're going to be using it and that it's actually useful and relevant in your context. Thank you, yeah, Vincent. I, I, Julie, you want to add in? And just add on, I mean, according to my shared experience, right, the machine, you must be comfortable to do so that you can have that shared experience with your child. So I would say that. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Thanks, uh, Vincent and uh, Julie for your take on that question. And I've been reminded that um, that, the, that question is the absolute last question and we should end the Q&A session because we are way be beyond uh, 7 p.m. So anyway, I'll hand you back to Ashif who will close this evening session. Ashif, please. All right, thank you, thank you. So we have officially come to the end of the program. So I'd like to thank Joe, Vincent for the interesting uh, sharing and insights. And of course, our uh, very chirpy and Dr. Yo for moderating the discussion. Uh, yeah, if we, anyone have any questions, you can always email to NLB and then we will forward the questions if it's need be to the relevant speakers for this evening. With that, I'd like to thank all of you, the audience, and have a very good evening.